The China and Africa podcast is brought to you in partnership with the Africa China Reporting Project at Wits University in Johannesburg. The ACRP promotes balanced, considered reporting on Africa China relations through innovative training programs held throughout the year. More information at africachinareporting.co.za. Hello and welcome to another edition of the China in Africa podcast. I'm Eric Olander, and as always, I'm joined by Kobus Van Staden, a senior China Africa researcher at the South African Institute of International Affairs in Johannesburg, South Africa. Very good afternoon to you, Kobus. Good afternoon. Well, Kobus, at the end of this month, April 25 through 27, uh, is going to be a very big summit here in China, in Beijing, at the second Belt and Road Summit. So we thought it would be a good opportunity for us to check in on the One Belt, One Road project that uh, really captures a lot of headlines now about China. And it fits into this narrative that we've discussed on a number of occasions about the debt trap diplomacy, the predatory landing, and a lot of that comes back to One Belt, One Road. Uh, 126 countries, 29 international organizations will be coming to the summit, uh, and that's all part of the Belt and Road. The most interesting part is that now uh, the first G7 country, Italy, will be a member of Belt and Road. And uh, it's really, I think, we sh- maybe before we get too into the weeds on how Belt and Road is impacting Africa, Cobus, why don't we just kind of maybe give a refresher as to what is Belt and Road and why is important, particularly for our audience in Africa? This is a slightly difficult thing to do because the concept itself has has proved quite amorphous over time. Um, it was it was coined, um, if I remember correctly, I think 2013 um, by by uh, Chinese President Xi Jinping, um, and it is basically um, in diff- in its different forms. It's the idea that it's a, a global rollout um, of infrastructure that that will connect China to um, to other significant economic hubs over land and oversea. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm being a bit vague. Originally, in, in, in one of its earlier coinings, the idea was essentially that it would be two routes, one, uh, one across sea um, and the other across, uh, across the land, which would be the, uh, the 21st century um, Silk Road economic belt um, and the, um, the maritime Silk Road. Mm-hmm. The Maritime Silk Road, that's yeah. right. So uh, the one would be, was a, a series of routes running um, across the Indian Ocean, connecting um, to Kenya and then up through the Suez Canal to the Mediterranean. And the other was across Central Asia um, over land, um, essentially a, a series of rail lines and pipelines. Um connecting China to Europe. Since then, the concept has morphed a little bit, and it now essentially uh, includes almost all of China's outward development work. Um, so many, many projects are now are now um, described as Belt and Road projects, even if they don't fit into the original map of what the Belt and Road was supposed to be. Um, so now we have a situation where a country like Nigeria, for example, recently signed on to the Belt and Road uh, in, uh, initially Initiative, despite the fact that originally Nigeria wasn't wasn't in the zone, you know, on on on, on the original map, um, so it essentially is now uh, the the concept has basically been stretched to include you know most of China's significant overseas engagement, both economically and politically. Yeah, and it's that ambiguity that both creates opportunity for the Chinese to be able to define whatever they want it to be. But it also gives the chance for China's critics like the United States to also define it to whatever they want it to be. So uh, 126 countries, 29 international organizations, 37 foreign leaders. So 37 of the 126 will be in Beijing to cement the relationship with the Chinese. It's not always clear, though, as to why certain countries, as you pointed out, are members. I was asked the other day, why is Senegal a member of Belt and Road? And I didn't have a clear answer because when you look at the original map, Africa's eastern shore, so basically the Belt and Road came across from the Indian Ocean, hit the port of Mombasa in Kenya, then winds its way up the eastern shore through the Suez Canal and then into the Middle East and and so forth and back around to China. That makes sense. So how does it work that a country like Nigeria or Senegal or some of these other countries are part of it? We're going to look into that. Let me just give you a little bit of a sense of what's been going on lately with Belt and Road. 
uh, just over the past couple of months. And this is data from the RWR Advisory Group in the United States. They monitor Belt and Road. Uh, in From March 26th to April 9th, Sub-Saharan Africa was the region with the highest concentration of new Belt and Road projects. And these new projects totaled $4.67 billion. Now, that's just from March 26th to April 9th, which is an astonishing amount of money when you think about it in the context of the amounts that other governments are committing to development projects. So in one month, we're talking almost $5 billion. In that one month, they've committed to build 208.2 kilometers of new road, roads, highway projects, and railway projects. And the most activity was actually happening in Pakistan, where a $1.3 billion hydroelectric project uh, was committed to. So this is really, uh, you know, the scale of it is still very, very large. The precise numbers as to how much the Chinese have spent around the world are very hard to come by. Um, but there are estimates somewhere in the 200 to 300 billion dollars. Now, a lot of this is coming in a way that Xi Jinping, he's not so happy with how things have been working out. So there's been some pushback. We've talked a lot about the incident in Sri Lanka at the Habandota port. Uh, there's also there was a, a big controversy and turmoil in Malaysia where President Mohammed Mahathir pushed back on a Belt and Road project. So not everything has gone well. President Xi came out and he said, well, he doesn't want to do any more what he called vanity projects. So they're going to start tightening the screws a little bit. But up until today, there have been 3,116 Belt and Road Initiative projects built worldwide. Again, a truly astounding number of projects that are being built worldwide. So we wanted to dive in a little bit to kind of give some perspective on the Belt and Road with a focus a little bit on Africa, but also how Africa fits into the bigger picture. So we couldn't find a better expert than the one we've got. Uh, Eric uh, Mike Sterino is a master's student at North Carolina State University School of Public and International Affairs and a graduate research assistant at Duke's Nicholas Institute of Environmental Policy Solutions, where he works on green BRI. And uh, most importantly for our interest, he's also the editor and the host of the Belt and Road podcast. So a fantastic podcast that's part of my weekly uh, pattern uh, and media diet. So a very, very good morning, Eric, all the way from North Carolina. Thank you so much, Eric and Kobus. It's such a pleasure to be here. And it's so great that you listen to the show too. Oh, well, listen, for those of you who are longtime followers of the show, Eric is, uh, he goes way back almost to the beginning in 2010 with us. And uh, for our Chinese listeners, you may recognize Eric because he was our Weibo editor uh, back in, I think, 2011 or 2012. We've stopped publishing in Chinese for, uh, you know, lots of different reasons, but mostly for, you know, security reasons, because it's not a good idea to publish in Chinese. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, so Eric is an old friend of the show, going back almost to the very, very beginning. And we are truly honored that you got up early to join us and that you're back on the show again. I'm honored to be here. Thanks again. Well, let's start. I gave this introduction to where we are with BRI. It's big. It's amorphous. It's ambiguous. It's global. Uh, why don't you give us your take as somebody who thinks about BRI every week for your podcast, but also in your work that you're doing at both uh, North Carolina State and at Duke. Uh, tell us your take on where we are, the pulse check of it, because BRI does seem to be a Rorschach test for whoever's looking at it. And I just want to get your sense so that we can kind of start our conversation with the, the 10,000 foot view. Yeah, that's one of the most difficult uh, questions to answer right away. Is this the idea of uh, even the baseline of what Kobus had to answer? The beginning, what is the Belt and Road Initiative? Um, and, you know, because it started from 2013 in Kazakhstan, you know, uh, Xi Jinping talking about the Silk Road economic belt and then uh, the 21st century maritime Silk Road. But um, and then it's so often in any type of news story, you'll see there'll be these maps and this map you know, first had the two, the overland and the and the and the oversea in the Indian Ocean, the maritime line. And then it expanded to having these five economic corridors throughout Eurasia. But now you have Nigeria joining the Belt and Road Initiative, Senegal, you have Italy joining the Belt and Road Initiative. And actually, those maps within China have been banned since 2017. There is no official map towards the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, and so you have this, you know, originally was very much formulated as this 60 to 70 odd country throughout Eurasia um, um, cord, uh, uh, project of, of 
of creating these connectivity corridors through uh, rail, through ports, through uh, through pipelines. But now it's it's transformed to a basically Chinese global economic foreign policy. Uh, and there's even in politics and even a little bit of military has been brought into it, security, ICT infrastructure, um, and the encroachment into or not the addition of Italy was a was a very big story uh, recently. And so defining what gets included in the Belt and Road Initiative, what doesn't um, has been a very big story um, or just it's 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 difficult to even come up with from the beginning and what it all means. And I I could. In my notes of what I was had for the show, I had the idea of the Rorschach test, where basically wherever the stance or China watchers or analysts or whatever somebody thinks about China prior to the Belt and Road Initiative, they basically place upon the Belt and Road Initiative because there's no preconceived notions as to what's included, what's not included. Um, uh, they place the prior ideas as to what the Belt and Road Initiative is. So if you saw China, the China threat, if as 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 if. Um, then you see the Belt and Road Initiative as this uh, play into geostrategic dominance you know, to overtake the global international order, uh, debt trap diplomacy type uh, um, uh, narratives. Um, but um, so in terms of where we are now, there are those there have been the, as you stated, the concerns of the, the, the pushback on, on the debt sustainability issues. Uh, there has been um, pushback on environmental and social uh, um, unrest that have been that has been brought about from um, Chinese finance infrastructure pro projects, which have been included within the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, sorry to interrupt. Um, do you have any? You know, we 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 mentioned, you know, that that the definition of the 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 geographical scope of the Belt and Road is very has become you know quite quite difficult to to pin down, but has its time scale been been defined? Is there is there any kind of parameters coming out of Beijing of how long the Belt and Road is supposed to the the the, the project is supposed to go or the, the initiative is supposed to go, and what constitutes a, a, a kind of a, an organic ending of the initiative or or a success or failure? Um, you could, you like have those criteria been been set at all? No, those criteria have not been set. There is not a time frame. Um, I mean, some people have, I've heard a few decades, but it's there's no official time frame as to when it's supposed to, when it even started or when it even ended. I mean, many people place the start from uh, 2013, but the first actual official document, the vision and action document that was put up by the National Development Reform Commission, didn't come out to 2015. Uh, and that was very much vague platitudes as to uh, the kind of the goals and the purposes of the Belt and Road Initiative, but uh, did not have any specific guidelines as to what is a part of the Belt and Road Initiative, what isn't a part of the Belt and Road Initiative. Actually, within this uh, upcoming forum, the NDRC, which is supposed to be is seen as one of the main uh, regulators or planners of the Belt and Road Initiative, if there could be one, uh, is supposed to now in 2019 set out the definition as to what is a Belt and Road project and what is not. Uh, and so there isn't a clear time frame as to when it is supposed to end. There's not a clear time frame of what is included in the Belt and Road Initiative. Actually, in terms of the geogra geographic scope, since its beginning, uh, when it had you know sixty some odd countries that began with it, it was always stated that it was open to any country that wanted to join. Um, but now, countries that do join, there isn't a clear clear data that shows that joining benefits or actually changes any of the bilateral relationship prior bilateral relationship that happens between China and that country. Um, and so uh, the document. Thus far, that is known, they're of their MOUs. They're non-binding. They're um, not uh, they, and so it's it's more of a uh, branding mechanism of 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 China's uh, foreign policy outreach rather than all right, this is Belt and Road. You have signed on to this. Now you get this infrastructure projects. Um, I mean, France after Italy uh, joined uh, the Belt and Road. Uh, you know, France was also pressured to. France decided not to, and they got a whole lot more money and projects and investments than Italy did. Uh, and there, it's in terms of time frame, it's been tough to do large end studies of this. Plus, the opaqueness of Chinese financing—you don't know uh, 
you know, how much money actually goes away or when. But in terms of the best data that's available, there hasn't been any showing that becoming being a part of one of the five traditional Belt and Road Economic Corridors or being joining the Belt and Road Initiative actually brings you more financing for infrastructure projects than not joining it. And so it's it's very unclear as to the geograph the 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 time scale of the Belt and Road is when it's supposed to end, what's included in the Belt and Road Initiative and what's not included. Uh, for my purposes, I tend to conflate or I, I tend to think of the Belt and Road Initiative as anything in which is financed by a Chinese state policy bank, which would be the Chinese Exim Bank, Export Import Bank, or the China's Development Bank, which uh, it's been estimated since the Belt and Road Initiative has started about $130 billion from the XM Bank and $190 billion from the China Development Bank, uh, financing a Chinese state-owned enterprise to build a infrastructure project, so railroad, hydroelectric dam, these type of projects uh, throughout a country in which is labeled a Belt and Road country. Um, it is interesting, though, in terms of updates on the Belt and Road, um, that thus far in 2019, the China Development Bank, uh, I think it was FT came out with an article of, a few weeks ago, has not released any financing for any types of infrastructure projects this year. So there has been a slowdown of this. And if that's correlated to the pushback the Belt and Road has been seeing, or if that's correlated to um, just uh, China's domestic political uh, or polit political economy that does not want to, that does not have the finances and excess uh, foreign reserves that it used to have uh, to to have this kind of more liberalized lending uh, across the world and more focused on the domestic economy is soon, it's unclear. Be, be care maybe be careful of over interpreting that, I think, in part because, you, you know, the, the Chinese are in such a sensitive political space right now with their relations with the United States and even the politics with Malaysia and what's happened in Sri Lanka. And there might be a reassessment that's going on right now. So again, Made in China 2025, which was a key part of this the Xi Jinping's platform for the future, Belt and Road being a part of that too, that's no longer on the table because they felt like they were antagonizing and it wasn't helping them in their relationship with the United States. So this might be just a shifting of the rhetoric and also a shifting of the strategy while they're in this face-off with the Trump administration. We, again, we don't know. Um, let me just echo what you've been saying a little bit, Eric. Um, and there was a great quote from a senior fellow at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, a think tank in Washington, uh, from an analyst there who said, Belt and Road looks like a grand strategy on aspirational maps, but on the ground, it's being shaped and skewed by a host of competing actors. And this is one of the cautionary tales that I'd like to tell people about their reading of China is that oftentimes there's this feeling that China is this highly centralized, very organized communist machine that goes out with a plan and just, you know, charges ahead. And what we see in the fact that we can't even define Belt and Road and the Chinese can't define Belt and Road, nobody really can. We don't know how much money is being spent. The opacity is everywhere. The lack of transparency is endemic, um, makes it so that really there is a lot more chaos that's going on here. And this is there's a lot of competing actors, state-owned enterprise, private contractors and whatnot. And so I guess, you know, as we might take on it, as we look at it, is that Belt and Road is one of the foundational pieces of China's kind of vision for its geopolitics. Um, the United States used to have a vision for its geopolitics. It used to be open markets, democracy, freedom. I, I don't know if we as Americans truly believe in that anymore, particularly because we're, we have a lot of tariffs going on. We're supporting uh, less democratic or, uh, countries and whatnot. So it's hard to tell what the United States stands for. What China stands for, at least through the prism of Belt and Road, is building stuff, facilitating trade, uh, gaining influence through loans, whatever that you – how they want to do it. Um, but when you look at Belt and Road as part of that foundational piece of their diplomacy and their foreign policy, does that resonate with you in the research that you've done? Yes, it does. And – more the more so the the former which you spoke about of the decentralized nature of how it all plays out and who are the actual actors on the ground that play out the Belt and Road Initiative uh, rather than uh, the idea of a grand strategy. Um, the you know I I, I very very much admire uh, this the work of Lee Jones and Zheng Jinghang and Shahar Hamiri who's looking at the Belt and Road Initiative 
through the lens of a state transformation analysis, and they look at the d competing domestic uh, factions, the domestic policymaking aspects within the uh, Chinese domestic political economy, and how that expands internationally, and how you can really much more understand the Belt and Road Initiative through that type of lens. And also understanding that so the main players within within the actual placing out of Belt and Road projects that then turn into the Belt and Road Initiative is much more of a bottom up feed than a top down um, than a top down process. Although both certainly do exist, but it's it's disaggregated, decentralized interests of Chinese state owned enterprises uh, who are suffering from overcapacity and lack of of in demand of building domestically within China. Um, uh, policy banks and host country governments, and oftentimes uh, the Chinese the the projects that are listed within the Belt and Road Initiative, or that are often talked about as the being a part of the Belt and Road Initiative, um, are projects that were actually first began not from a bilateral dialogue that happened between uh, you know, Chinese political actors and uh, and host country elites, but actually Chinese state owned enterprises who already had. Um, who already had market presence uh, on the ground within that country and made their own connections with domestic political elites in that host country. And then for the purpose of their easy access to uh, state backed credit from the Chinese policy banks uh, and their technical know how to build infrastructure that is very much wanted for very positive reasons or sometimes you know, nefarious or corrupt reasons within the host country. Um, it's kind of it's, it's that nexus of what creates the the demand and the and the actual 3100 plus projects that exist within the Belt and Road Initiative. So as much as the major projects uh, such as the high speed railroad or the road or the projects that have strategic uh, that involve strategic minerals or the pipeline in Myanmar. I mean, these, of course, uh, are done very much at uh, high ends of the Chinese government and high, high end of the host country governments on a bilateral basis. But lots of the the smaller projects, the um, I mean, st central state authorities from the NDRC or the state council do not need to approve a policy bank project unless it's over a billion dollars or two billion dollars for the state council. So I'm, for, I'm sorry, very, very quickly. What is the NDRC? That's the National Development and Reform Commission. Sorry, it's it's known as uh, the, uh, it's a regulator and planner for do domestic economic development within China, but then also are one of the planners for or supposedly planners or regulators for the Belt and Road Initiative. But uh, it's that's also somewhat decentralized and disaggregated. But uh, and they also have a lack of capacity to really all, all the time do proper regulation of the state of their state of enterprises abroad um, because yeah, I'll leave it there before I get way too into it. It seems to me, um, you know, that there's, there's two levels running on the, on the BRI, the, you know, there's this, all of these, all of these, you know, thousands of projects being implemented in different countries by different, um, you know, sub-state actors, um, you know, private enterprise, you know, different politicians kind of having connections with different different companies and, and you know, setting up these different projects. And then the overarching role of, which is almost a kind of a storytelling role, you know, kind of where, where the a, a kind of overarching vision of China's position in the world is being articulated and kind of fitted some sometimes imperfectly on top of a very chaotic set of projects. Um, so, you know, to, to which extent do you feel um, is the Belt and Road really distinct from earlier iterations of, of Chinese companies moving out, like particularly the going out um, strategy of, of the 90s? To which extent is the Belt and Road Initiative essentially a new name slapped on an already existing strategy? And to which extent, or to which extent is... Are there real differences between the going out strategy and the BRI? Um, this is an uh, issue of much debate uh, within circles of people who watch the Belt and Road. I very much stem from the idea that Belt and Road Initiative is basically going out or going global 2.0. Uh, I mean, many of the projects in which are often cited as you know the Hambeto to port, you know, it's the one example that is utilized of debt trap diplomacy. That was all, if you put 2013 as the functioning line of the Belt and Road Initiative, I can't remember the exact dates, but that, that started talks on the Hanbei Road Report in 2005, 2006. And even that project uh, was a project in which initiated um, from a Chinese state-owned enterprise that had their own 
personal connections with the with the president of Sri Lanka at the time that then persuaded um, or that then lobbied the, the, the then president to then lobby uh, the the uh, Chinese delegation to fund the state owned enterprise to build that port. Um, and so it's in terms of uh, it's it's very much a continuation. And it's interesting, you, you know, you said I've been a long time listener of the show. I've been uh, very interested as a uh, uh, it, within this topic of you know China Africa relations uh, and especially within the infrastructure development realm, since you know kind of that went mainstream in 2008 Olympics and that sort of era, uh, there's so many similar dynamics of what happens in the Belt and Road. And there's so many similar dynamics in terms of the narrative uh, or the popular narrative in, in in Western mainstream media of the Belt and Road as a, as to the old of uh, the older China Africa narratives as well. So I don't see a whole lot of the difference. It's still policy banks financing state owned enterprises um, at different levels. Uh, and there are very, very few private actors. I know Kobe you said private. Uh, there certainly are more market oriented uh, state owned enterprises, but they 95% of projects in which are financed uh, through the Belt and Road Initiative are financing Chinese state-owned enterprises. Um, that's very interesting because the reason I said private is I was actually thinking that the company that was in my mind was Huawei, and particularly, particularly the, um, the you know some of the undersea cable lines. So I'm, I'm actually it's it's very interesting to hear that that state-owned enterprises have such a big proportion of the funding. Yeah, you know, it's Chinese state-owned enterprises are almost. All, almost all of the funding um, for Belt and Road or Belt and Road type projects is how I usually describe it um, to encompass not only the first countries or first iterations. Uh, it's also um, important to n notice of how the Belt and Road type contracts are arranged. So the vast, the majority, uh, I think I saw somewhere in the 60 or 70%, I think the, the, um, the AEI's China investment tracker had this once, uh, of, the pro of the Belt and Road type projects that Chinese SOEs conduct are what are called EPC contracts. These are engineering, procurement, and construction contracts. And so when I speak to Chinese state owned enterprises, many other scholars uh, as well have, have spoken to Chinese state owned enterprises, who actually build this type of infrastructure and they say, uh, you know, the, your responsibility towards it, uh, towards sustainability, towards the debt and everything else. And they see themselves and somewhat rightly so as they are contractors. It And there's so much agency and, and drive as to what project gets made uh, and where that project is placed that is taken upon by the host country elites, whether that be at national levels, whether it be sub-state levels within that country, or sometimes even private actors or ministries. Now, this is not true for you know the major you know high you know, high speed railway that uh, those type of major projects that are very much directly connected to China, or maybe some projects that go specifically to mineral resources, strategic mineral resources that China is trying to develop. But many of these projects. They stem from Chinese or from host country uh, wants and plan and development plans. Uh, I mean, I just spoke with a, uh, managers at Chinese state owned enterprise and a, who were building hydroelectric dams in, in Vietnam. And I was like, you know, how did you choose to have your project here? And they said, well, the en energy ministry have had a plan for the last few decades that was developed by Japan's uh, development assistance back in the 90s or whenever. And they said that these were a dance we're going. We've been wanting to have these for a while. We just haven't had the financing or the ability to build this. We want you to build this. They signed the contract to do it. And they're able to provide the financing because they have an ease of access to basically almost subsidized credit or a credit at a lower internal rate of return uh, than a World Bank contract would do. And it would be much, much fasterly faster much quick much more quickly implemented <laughs> from the beginning to the end cycle so there's many there's so many interests uh that uh are at stake from not only and i feel the conversation of the belt and road is so often looked at not only from a china specific lens but a china central state specific lens well there's so many decentralized sub-state actors whether it be provincial governments have a lot of power state owned enterprises have a lot of power um and policy banks have 
a, a, a good a good amount of money. And then their their relationships that each of these actors have on their own with host country elites. And it's kind of that trifecta in which I don't want to, which I've tried to really highlight on my podcast itself is try to look at the dynamics of not Belt and Road as a whole as to, because uh, it can be a fallacy, I think, sometimes to see, oh, there's been pushback in, in Malaysia on the Belt and Road. Is the Belt and Road going to survive as if, What's happening in internal internal political economy economic dynamics in Malaysia really corresponds to this, what's happening in Kenya, what's happening in South Africa, what's happening in in, in Chile with Chinese state backed money. Certainly, there are lessons and, and clues that we can relate for them, but I, I feel that oftentimes that is overblown, and the the look as to what the at the host country. A political economic or political economy dynamics and the host country elites interests in utilizing the Chinese bank capital and um, and their need for infrastructure uh, is often sorely lost in the conversation. Support for this podcast comes from the Africa China Reporting Project at Witt University School of Journalism in Johannesburg. The ACRP provides reporting grants, workshops, and other professional development opportunities for both African and Chinese journalists. Follow the ACRP on Twitter at Vits China Africa or visit africachinareporting.co.za for information about grants and upcoming seminars. So when you talk to people in the United States who, again, are the, the most vocal critics of Belt and Road, two issues come up. Number one is the predatory lending and the lack of transparency about the loans, what they call this debt trap diplomacy where you, you know, China loans a country, huge amounts of money, the country then invariably can't pay it back. So then China will uh, repossess or take possession of key strategic infrastructure assets. That's the fear. It has not borne itself out. Professor Deborah Braudigam at Johns Hopkins University just recently wrote an excellent article talking about how this is really a fallacy in many ways, you know, put up, put forth by the United States. Nonetheless, that's out there in the ether and it's something very, very widespread. The other one is that China is going to use Belt and Road to offshore its pollution. So here in China right now, they are actually doing a much better job at cracking down on polluters. Uh, the, the air in Shanghai has gotten better steadily over the years. Uh, Middle class Chinese consumers have said enough. We want to have cleaner air, water and land. Uh, and so Chinese industry now is moving offshore. And there are concerns that, that China is going to be exporting uh, its, its technology in coal, its manufacturing, and it's going to be putting those along Belt and Road countries. I think the best example of this is uh, the coal-fired power plant that's being built in Lamu Island in Kenya. And that's the one that a lot of journalists and Western stakeholders look to as an example of, aha, this is where Belt and Road is really going to be going, which is polluting the rest of the world at the expense of their health while China uh, you know, becomes cleaner and healthier. So you've done a lot of work in the green aspect of Belt and Road. In fact, that's most of your work. You have a new uh, column that's going to be coming out, an article that uh, you, you co-authored with a senior fellow at the Nicholas Institute for Environmental Policy Solutions at Duke. Uh, why don't you very quickly, since we're running short on time here, tell us a little bit about the green aspects of BRI and end on the two recommendations that you put forth in your column uh, about what the other stakeholders should do in response. Yeah, since the beginning, uh, Xi Jinping has called for a green belt and road, although oftentimes they haven't lived up to, to, the, to their stated goals of having a green belt and road. That's especially apparent in the uh, uh, the. Uh, offshoring of especially subcritical coal, and there should be just all in all to stop financing of that. Uh, but our op-ed very specifically focused on um, creating a, a greener infrastructure projects. And so we had two specific recommendations that could be implemented now, one that has a longer term uh, uh, longer term setting and one that could be implemented now and ha could have very immediate uh, effects on greening the Belt and Road. Uh, that also takes into consideration the decentralized nature of it and the lack of capacity many Chinese regulatory agencies have on uh, on regulating Chinese state-owned enterprise behavior abroad. And so the first one is to uh, 
work with host country governments and civil societies to carry out strategic environmental assessments uh, in conjunction with the Belt and Road Economic Strat Strategic Planning. So as I said before, oftentimes uh, Belt and Road type projects are actually projects in which the host country has had planned um, from uh, either them themselves or through other development agencies uh, from decades prior. Uh, there already has been a lot of work China has done uh, with uh, host country governments. Uh, right now, the Ministry of Ecology and Environment has started an early stage environmental assessment process of Southeast Asian governments. That's great. But there could be uh, further work in coordination, uh, either bilaterally, uh, in, term, in looking at the long-term infrastructure and energy goals of these countries and trying to figure out ways of incorporating environmental planning within that. So you, before a project placement is even thought of, the uh, you, you can you can place project in areas in which will uh, have less damage or, or less of an impact on uh, biodiversity or climate change in these type of, of segments. The second one uh, that could be much more of an immediate impact would be ensuring. Um, any project that happens through the Belt and Road Initiative uh, must get political risk insurance from the China Export and Credit Insurance Corporation, or CINOSURE. And right now, CINOSURE, uh, they, uh, it's, it's the part prior to getting financing. And so it's basically the, the, the portion in which I have a road I want to build in Kenya. Uh, the as Chinese state-owned enterprise will then uh, bring it to CINOSURE and say, hey, will you insure this project? And if they say yes, almost always the Chinese uh, policy bank will then uh, lend money to this project. Although that has started to change a little bit as well. So right now, they within their political risk assessment, it's almost on a country scale and it's really vague, including environmental or social consideration for project level base. You could take out um, the worst uh, environmental and social uh, 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 projects right at its core because every project goes through CINOSURE. And we could also have more stringent requirements uh, for the major policy banks that adds more environmental and social safeguards uh, utilizing the latest uh, GIS data because environmental and social uh, risk is very much well tuned to economic risk of a project. And so it would be not only in the interest of China geopolitically, but China economically at, and the host country as well. So both the working on strategic environmental assessments uh, with host countries and also looking at the uh, insure, the, the state back uh, CINOSURE and the policy banks to integrate environmental uh, and social risk data into their project uh, risk analysis. And that column is not yet published yet, but as soon as it is live, I will share it on all of our various social channels uh, so that you can you can see what Eric kind of fleshed out along with his co-author Elizabeth uh, Losos, I think is her, is her name. And uh, it's an excellent column, so I hope that everybody has a chance to see it. Uh, everybody, if you are not sold on the fact that Eric knows what he's talking about when it comes to Belt and Road, then <laughs> I don't know what more information you need. This guy is just a, an encyclopedia of Belt and Road, and you can listen to the podcast. Uh, Eric, does it come out every week? What's the frequency of the podcast? We're getting it bi-weekly. I'm really excited. We're getting okay. a co-host soon, Juliet Liu, who was one of my prior. He's, she's a PhD at, uh, at, at Berkeley, um, and it's going to be great. So, uh, yeah. And how can people find it? It's on iTunes, Spotify, uh, SoundCloud, Google Play, just the Belt and Road podcast. And we're also on Twitter doing the latest news research and analysis of the Belt and Road at Belt and Road Pod. It's really excellent listening. It should be part of your China digest of all the different podcasts and reading that you do. There's, It's not exclusively about Africa, obviously, but at the same time, Belt and Road and Africa are linked inseparably and something very important to, to look at. So Eric Meister, you know, is a master's student at North Carolina State University in the School of Public International Affairs and also a graduate research assistant at Duke University. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. What a pleasure to have you back on the show after all these years. Let's not wait eight years now before the next time you come back. Thanks again. It's been such a pleasure. Kobus, normally when we get to this part of the show, I have a clearer sense about the issue that we've discussed throughout the prior 35, 40 minutes of the program. 
I got to be honest with you. I am more confused now than when we started the show, and that's no discredit to to Eric. I think it's a result of the fact that Belt and Road is a super complicated issue. No one really seems to know. It's a marvel to me that we are now approaching seven years since Xi Jinping launched Belt and Road in Central Asia. And yet here we are trying to figure out what it is. Now, imagine if people like you and I who do this for a living and try to figure out these things, the average person doesn't have any clue. And that's why one of the reasons why I think Belt and Road as a brand uh, that the Chinese certainly have tried to market internationally. Um, in China, it's a huge thing. Everybody knows what Belt and Road is just because of the propaganda. But outside of China, I don't think most people understand it. They don't care. Uh, they don't know what it means. They look at the construction projects. They think that's cool. Uh, they don't really know how it all ties together necessarily. Uh, but I think because this confusion about what it is, what it isn't, uh, is really problematic. And I, I think if the Chinese are smart, which I don't necessarily give them the credit for on this particular subject, uh, they're going to fine tune the messaging on this so that they can actually get out a coherent vision statement as to what is the Belt and Road. And no one really seems to know. I mean, that's that's pretty obvious after our discussion today. You know, what's, what's interesting is that um, at a recent conference, um, I, I, I listened to a paper by Danny Madrid Morales, a media scholar who we had on the podcast before, um, and we hope to have again soon to, to discuss this very issue. And he did this massive project where they ran, um, essentially, they, they, it's a content analysis where you take thousands of newspaper articles and then run them through software to see, ex you know, kind of roughly how how positive or negative their portrayal of a particular issue is. And, the, and he was looking at Belt and Road. Um, uh, you know, in, in the press of uh, the, the newspapers in uh, lots of different countries. Um, and he found that generally the coverage of Belt and Road outside of the U.S., except for the U.S., is generally positive. And I was quite surprised by that, you know, kind of maybe because we look at things through such a, uh, the lens of Western media, you know, where, where Belt and Road is frequently linked to debt trap issues and it's frequently seen from quite, you know, as a kind of a scary thing. Um, he, he showed that in lots of countries, except for the US, um, Belt and Road is generally seen through a positive and developmental kind of perspective. Um, and so, you know, that, that just, you know, it, it seems to even though it seems to be vague, it does seem to be connecting to, you know, kind of with, with journalists at least around the world. And maybe that, that that is the issue of, oh, they're building infrastructure, you know, so maybe that that part is easy to understand. Yeah, it is. It is very complicated. Uh, I think, again, I, I'm not so sure is it tied to Belt and Road branding or is it tied to Chinese development policy and Chinese money and Chinese investment uh, it's hard to separate the two because we don't know where one ends and the other begins. So, uh, But we would like to hear from you. What do you think of Belt and Road? Do you agree with what Kobus said here that in developing countries uh, or in other countries except the United States, Belt and Road is generally viewed as something uh, more positive? Do you have a better understanding of what Belt and Road is than uh, any of us today on the, on the conversation? And again, no disrespect to Eric, but it is a complicated, confusing subject that we're all trying to get our head around. Hopefully, we will learn more from the summit. Again, we are taping this before the summit, so we don't actually know what they're going to say. But by the time you listen to this, news coverage will be out. And so hopefully the news coverage from the summit will give you some indication as to what's going on. So that'll do it for this edition of the China and Africa podcast. Quickly before we go, uh, just one brief announcement. If you are in Shanghai on Friday, May 10th, and you're listening to the show before Friday, May 10th, uh, come and join us at Cartel. There's going to be, which is a bar in the French concession. Uh, we've got a great, great little event set up. Uh, Kobus, it's too bad you can't join us because yeah, this is going to be fun. Sad. We're going to be myth busting China, Africa kind of rumors and, and all the things. And I've got Lena, who wrote uh, Lena, as you knew, who wrote the China Africa Beginner's Guide. And we just recently had her on our show. And we've got Huang Hongxiang, uh, who is from China House, Kenya and, and myself. So it's going to be, a, you know, we're, we're at a bar on a Friday night. We're going to be talking China, Africa, having a lot of fun. If you are in the Shanghai area and want to join us, we would love to have you come out. Uh, so that'll be a lot of fun. And then uh, in later in May, in the fourth week of May, uh, I'll be up in Beijing at the China Africa Stories event, which happens every year, put on by Kente and Silk. Uh, there's a whole week of activities. Just look up China Africa Stories Beijing. Uh, if you're going to be in town, there's so many different, there's a fashion show, there's a 
Uh, we're going to have seminars. There's a, a Shark Tank kind of event, I think, going on. There's a lot of different events. This is an amazing thing that they put on every year. Lots of young people from uh, from China, Africa, and around the world that get together. So I'm super excited about that uh, on May 26th or 25th, somewhere around there. So look on the on, on, online for that, and you'll find that. So two events coming up here in China and uh, that we'll be participating in, and I just want to let you know, and I would love to see you guys if you have a chance to come out. If you can't make it and you want to get in touch with Kobus and I, uh, listen, email is a great way, eric at chinaafricaproject.com or Kobus at chinaafricaproject.com. So that'll do it for this edition. We'll be back again next week with another show of the China in Africa podcast. Thank you so much for listening. The discussion continues online. Head over to facebook.com slash China Africa Project to share your thoughts on today's show. The guys are also on Twitter, where you can find Gwobas at Stadinsky or Eric at E. Orlander. And be sure to sign up for the weekly China in Africa email newsletter by going to www.chinaafricaproject.com.